Welcome to uh, WASM plus Kubernetes beyond containers. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we can kind of leverage some of these technologies together uh, to build a working solution, to build WebAssembly services on the back end that are real and running uh, and solve some business problems along the way. My name is Sean Isom. I am a senior manager at Adobe working on optimizing our cloud infrastructure. And this is Colin. Colin's also a senior engineer at Adobe working on some of our uh, new WebAssembly based yeah. stack. Yeah. Web services, yes. Okay, so I always like to start with a quote or a thesis statement. Um, here's a somewhat provocative one. People don't really want innovation. This is a quote from Justin Etheridge. People talk about innovation a whole lot, but what they are re usually looking for is cheap wins and novelty. If you truly innovate and change the way that people have to do things, expect mostly negative feedback. If you believe in what you're doing, and know it will really improve things, then brace yourself for a long battle. Show of hands in the room. Who can, who can empathize with this in this room? I'm sure we've all been here with uh, technologies before. So, you know, I think, you know, still wanna keep this to be a very positive talk, but a lot of this is gonna be some of the lessons we've learned on, along the way, getting into the state we're in today where we can kind of get some of these technologies interoperating. Uh, Wasm is the tool, I, I personally believe it is the tool to write better software faster, but uh, innovating is, is hard, especially in a large, uh, enterprise organization. Uh, so we'll just talk briefly, you know, I'm gonna start with a little bit of history of container. I don't wanna bore you too much with some of our background on Kubernetes. This is WASM day, not Kubernetes day <laughs> right now, but uh, understand a little bit of the history, you know, some of our current setup, uh, how we're thinking about this, some of the business problems we're gonna solve. Colin's gonna have a pretty awesome demo of some of the stuff working in production. Uh, and then, you know, summarizing, summarizing why we think this is worth it. History, so, all right, so, what do we mean when we mean running things in the cloud? Uh, obviously, a lot of us probably remember pre-container days, uh, VM-backed services. Um, these are the, 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 the dark days um, before containers magically fixed everything for us. Um, there was a group at Adobe, it was, it was a startup that they actually acquired called Behance, uh, that was really focused on solving a couple of different problems. First was CICD. Um, this is something that other people can probably empathize as well, but build nights, right? Trying to move all that code out to production, trying to get all these systems working together. Uh, that's a challenging task. And so, uh, you know, kind of standardizing around, this is early, uh, late, late 2014, early 2015, standardizing around a CICD framework uh, that could be used to help automate and solve some of those pain points. Uh, and then deploying Apache Mesos to run containers. Uh, first as like system D units. I don't know if anyone remembers those days, but uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that was kind of the leading way, I'd say, but, this is a little bit before I think ECS was even released. So this, this is the, the bad old days of containers. Um, why, why did we do this, right? So if you think about a developer, this is a Adobe developer, but again, a lot of you can probably empathize with this as well. Um, what are the things that a developer has to think about? There's a lot of different things and that landscape is changing all over the time with technologies. And you know, really like this causes problems when you're trying to do things in a large organization. Do you want you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 different teams, different orgs, different geos reinventing the wheel all over time? Uh, I don't think so. And so thus in 2015, Ethos was born uh, late, yeah, late 2015, early 2016. And so the idea behind the Ethos project was can we run multi-tenant web services at Adobe? Like can we magically get all these different service teams interoperating, putting their stuff together? Uh, containers was the tool of choice based off of Mesos, based off our CI CD framework. Uh, and you know, kind of automagically scale, you know, uh, get those, uh, get the cost efficiency from uh, the economies of scale of running those together. So, um, you know, running Mesos manually is hard. We standardized around DC DCOS 2017, uh, migrated everything over to that. Um, you know, DCOS was a great platform for us for, for uh, many years, but there's a lot of things we had to build ourselves that did not come out of the box. And, uh, you know, obviously you see the direction the community has gone. So starting late 2018, 2000, uh, early 2019, we started uh, building around, retooling the entire platform around Kubernetes. Uh, when we think about web services, there's kind of three different models that exist in Kubernetes. There's uh, Ethos CAS, which is Container as a Service, and this is kind of where we took that paved path for, for DCOS and we replicated that experience in Kubernetes, but obviously infrastructure as code with, you know, the vast amount of Kubernetes experience that the community has, 
uh, we built this new PaaS based system too, where you can provision namespace on a cluster and you know, get some basic network policies and get write access in that namespace and hook up your own CICD tool or do whatever you want, deploy your own infrastructure in there. And then fairly new is using uh, Argo and Helm the product called Flex, which is how we can kind of get the best of both worlds, where we can give you a CICD suite but actually give you write access as well so you can create your own cloud native resources. Um, Ethos is a huge project, powers, I would say, at this point, most of Adobe's web services. Uh, over 5,000 production services, lots of containers, lots of CPUs. Um, this is kind of interesting, this is gonna be a central theme of this talk, is this concept of multi-tenancy, right? And so you talk to a lot of other large companies, uh, you know, there's 500 clusters, 1,000 clusters, there's an infinite number of Kubernetes clusters that are running. Uh, this has scaled up a lot in the last, uh, you know, year or so, I would say, like, we, this count was under 100 for a while because of our multi-tenancy. Uh, that has scaled out, but we're still at 285 clusters running, you know, those kinds of statistics. So I think that's pretty notable. Uh, where, where, so along that journey, where has that gotten us today? Um, I'd say our Kubernetes has been very successful given those numbers. Uh, we still have, you know, kind of that unified SRE operations model. We have a security model that other teams would have to onboard to by default. Uh, we are still mostly a 12-factor app-based system, mostly a multi-tenant system. Uh, as that cluster count has gotten larger, uh, I would say that over time we have, uh, you know, pivoted a little, little bit away from that, um, you know, for specific larger workloads. But the idea is that, you know, we can provide this basic platform for hosting services. We can be cloud agnostic. We can be platform agnostic. We can run containers as a service. We can ra run, I mean, streaming work workloads. Anything you can name and essentially provide this infrastructure as a service with an additional set of value add components on top of it. Okay, so again, this is WASM day. Let's start talking about what WASM can do for us. So uh, as we look to how multi-tenancy works in Kubernetes today, uh, it is operationally very simple. It allows us to get you know, uh, economies of scale with our people, with our cluster operations. Um, this promise of you know, just make everything multi-tenant, you've got large applications, you've got small applications, they're just gonna fill up all the space automatically and get rid of all of your overhead. That's not really the case. It's very efficient in theory, but you know, uh, when you start mixing applications, different architectures, different scheduling constraints, different taints and tolerations, different zone affinities, uh, you know, minimum rec replica counts that are more than the nodes in the cluster, you can imagine how over time things scale out and things, the efficiency level drops. Um, so you know, I'm not here to convince you that you should get rid of Kubernetes. Obviously, a lot of people are running Kubernetes, but when you ha run this kind of multi-tenant setup, while it's operationally very excellent, uh, it can be very expensive to run. And so when we're looking at what's next, and for, for us today, that's WebAssembly, uh, you know, we want to be able to leverage our existing investment in Kubernetes. Uh, we've got a lot of it. Uh, we know how to work with it. We've got all these different other resources that you know, these hundreds to thousands of teams within Adobe have built for these thousands to tens of thousands of services that are already operating in Kubernetes. So we need a model where we can still leverage that investment, be, but be able to integrate in uh, what's new. So kind of the question is, what if there's a better way? Can we make some of these things work together using WebAssembly? And so, uh, you know, how I'm personally thinking about this is a model more towards fast. I would not say pure fast, but, uh, and actually, let's go to the next slide. There's a lot of services that are running on our platform uh, that look kind of like this. You know, we, it's, it's a, like I said, multi-tenant platform, lots of different types of services, but the standard service, if I was to define what a service looks like, it's probably written in Java, Spring Boot, uh, using a lot of internal libraries. So you'll pull some utilization statistics, about 28% CPU utilization, about 55% RAM utilization. So that's good, but not great, right? And so what that really means is that like, we've got a large Java service that's serving web traffic, and it's going to take incoming requests and crunch some numbers on them, and then maybe like fire off a call to an external dependency, pull some data from a database, wait for that other external dependency to do something, and then, you know, with that transformed data, send it back to the user, maybe you know, asynchronously go store that, you know, send that to another service, store it in another data system. And it's kind of like data processing flow, I would say, is, is a very standard workflow that's replicated across hundreds, if not thousands, of services. And so if you look at a compute profile of those services, right, like we're as strong as our weakest link, which for this one, I might have pulled the wrong example, but uh, the idea often that is CPU, right? We're memory bound, we're IOPS bound. We've got some other constraining component and there's just idling CPU there uh, that we'd like to be able to do something with. So uh, 
how could WebAssembly be the answer to this then? Um, let's give a bit of background on how WebAssembly at Adobe has historically worked. Uh, we have a lot of experience with this on the browser side and actually predating WebAssembly, uh, if anybody remembers portable native client from Google, uh, Asm.js, you know, kind of predecessors of WebAssembly. These are all things that have been integrated into Adobe products over the last 10 years, starting with the Lightroom Web Beta, all the way to the production version, Acrobat Web, uh, moving towards the, you know, our flagship experience of Photoshop, which has been running in beta and browser for almost a year now, um, and some next generation products where Wasm's really a key enabler in allowing us to, to build that rich client experience uh, in a web browser. So we have all this experience working with WebAssembly code already, mostly you know, taking native code, mostly interoperating, interoperating with JavaScript, but uh, it's something that, that you know, we have the experience to leverage in other places because it, it meets all these same requirements that we're looking for the back end. It's a very high performance system. It is uh, secure by default, for example, right? We don't have to worry about uh, multi-tenant isolation. So this is the experiment. How do we actually run this in Kubernetes? And so we're utilizing Wasm Cloud right now. Uh, you see on the left here, this is kind of a, a legacy setup, I would say. Um, this is, uh, and there's some, some links there, and you know, I'll send out the slides and everything, but if you take the Cosmonic Kubernetes applier, this is a script that allows you to kind of bootstrap a Wasm Cloud installation within a cluster. Uh, we started by doing this within a namespace, and so this is within the context of a client application. And that's important because uh, namespaces are isolated from each other, right? Like when a client service onboards to our system and we run a multi-tenant system, uh, if they need to VPC appear back to one of their own cloud resources, they get a net poll that allows their namespace and only their namespace to talk to that inside a multi-tenant cluster. And so uh, this was a nice way of kind of like keeping that, you know, namespace boundary isolation for external resources. Um, but as you can imagine, this probably didn't hit our efficiency goals as much as we would like because we're replicating that core Wasm Cloud infrastructure for every single app that needs to work this way. And so what we're moving towards is this more multi-tenant model. This is utilizing some very hot off the press scripts, uh, some coming out of the Wasm IO workshop uh, that the Cosmonic folks did. But essentially the, the, the idea here, which is this diagram on the right, is that within the namespace boundary, which is, are these blue boxes, we've got, uh, you know, we've got the automation to provision services, allow us to get ingress to talk to a WebAssembly module. We've got uh, Wasm Cloud providers running the back end. These can be like HTTP providers that are serving this HTTP traffic. And then uh, they communicate through NATs, you know, over this lattice, this green box, back to a pool of common Wasm Cloud hosts. And so with that, we have core compute capacity that's provisioned to just do work and do work in a FAS kind of way. And so we, uh, it's very efficient. We can run all of these different workloads side by side because they're secure by default. We can run the actual execution of that code outside of the namespace boundary. And then just communicating back and forth back up to providers that are running in namespace, uh, you know, using a, a NATS topic, uh, which is secured by default as well, uh, in order to then communicate with those external dependencies. So with this, it's, it's kind of, you know, the best of both worlds, if there is a best of both worlds to be had between Kubernetes and WebAssembly, because we can have other things that are still running in that namespace that we need to talk to that we can access. We can talk to all these external providers, um, but we're still able to drive down that uh, CPU cost by those greater economies of scale by actually isolating out the core client compute, not having those services just spending all of their time idling. Um, a lot of this is going to involve getting code working for WebAssembly in the first place and taking a service and building it for WebAssembly. So Colin has an uh, awesome amount of experience in demo here that he's going to show you. Yep. Thanks, Sean. So um, yeah, I, I have to preface this whole thing, because I didn't do this last time. I, I, for you who are in Valencia, maybe you might remember I gave a talk last year. So I'm going to preface this with, I'm going to read it. OK. Um, my goal is not to make any sort of criticism or indictment of decisions that have been made. This technology has a very bright future. Everyone involved should be very proud of what they've accomplished. Um, I'm just trying to highlight the work that still needs to be done um, in the next phase of focusing on developer experience. OK, so that afterwards, OK, if, if uh, I don't mean to offend. Um, so this is, you know, we've already hit a lot of these highlights. Uh, this is this Bailey. Uh, this is from her YouTube video with Luke Wagner. Um, so a lot of work, great work's been done, and uh, and it's really it's really great. It's been great to witness. Um, so uh, last year it was background removal. It was a really simple service. I think the hardest part for me was uh, taking a Spring Boot app and learning Rust. 
Um, so that was, that was the hardest part there. It, it just worked really flawlessly. And the, the reason was that it had very few dependencies. So um, I, would, I could take a signature, and I, would, I could uh, remove the background. And I think I ran it on maybe Fastly and Cloudflare, Wasm Cloud and Fermion Spin. Worked great. Um, this year is the content authenticity proxy. So uh, here we have the, the Holy Father, Balenciaga. Uh, so right, this is a very timely thing. And Adobe's really made a big investment in AI generation. Um, so this kind of thing. So is this a real image? Was it, was it AI generated? Was it modified in Photoshop? That kind of thing. Um, OK, so it sounds simple, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to have a proxy. This is meant to be running kind of on the, on the edge, close to the users, so CDN edge, think of that kind of thing, um, what we call CDN edge compute, right? User will pass a URL to the service. The service will download it, check it. Uh, it will uh, resize the image. Now, there's a cache. Maybe it's been cached. Uh, transcode it, so make, make, resize it. Uh, record that in the content authenticity manifest. So this is something Adobe's been working on, the content authenticity initiative. It's a embedded data in an image on um, the history of that image. And then uh, return the image and uh, push the transcoded image into cache. <clears throat> OK, so as I said before, last year worked really well because the only, the only crate that was a dependency really was image. Uh, and this year, uh, very different. Okay, so uh, fast image resize, because this is supposed to be fast. That needs sim SIMD, and the fast image resize crate before I started did not support WASM. Sim, uh, WASM. So there's some SIMD work. Um, the C2PA SDK needed to work with WebAssembly, WASI specifically, uh, oh, which required OpenSSL X509 ring in Chrono. So uh, I did what any... Uh, foolhardy developer did, I forked everything. Um, so, and the, the worst part was, when I, when I came to the Content Authenticity Initiative team, they said, um, uh, oh, it already supports WASM, right? Of course, it, it doesn't support WASM. It supports WASM in the browser, right? And that's kind of the problem, is the WASM32 unknown unknown target, which I used last year for background removal, wasn't going to work, because it was going to pick up Wasm Bindgen and JS Sys. And so I had to go through the cargo gut Toml and everywhere that required any of these crates in the code and do lots of little configs. So, you know, as you can see. Um, so that was, that, was a, that was a real challenge. Um, and actually, so I, I actually did get it all to compile, but the OpenSSL not quite there yet. So it actually kind of fell down. But this actually, this, this highlights um, kind of a positive thing is that I, I got it working in Wasm Cloud because I moved that OpenSSL into a provider. So once OpenSSL is ready for, um, for WASI, uh, the, it can go into the, into the WebAssembly boundary. Um, OK, so the SIMD, which is kind of the successful part. So I, I led. I, I lowered your expectations, and now here's the actual success. So um, this was what the real challenge here was getting WASI SIMD to actually be faster than WASI, or sorry, WebAssembly not SIMD, right? Um, so uh, and, and this is kind of a, a bigger point, which is WebAssembly would not be possible, or if it was, it would be much more complicated if CPU architectures were not so homogenized, right? Um, back, maybe back. 20 years ago, when we still had big Endian MIPS or PowerPC, this would be a different story, right? If we had to compile something and maybe it'll run big Endian, maybe it'll run little Endian, or, or you know, take anything else, right? There's a real uniformity now in CPU architecture. Um, but the problem is SIMD, very, very, uh, you know, SIMD instructions vary greatly between Neon and SSC4 and AVX512, right? So. Uh, this is the list. I took it from the inscription docs. Um, and uh, I had to avoid these. And of course, I didn't have to avoid them in my actual code. I had to avoid them in the optimized code, right? 
So here I have the most efficient way to write something, and that was 10 times slower than the fastest way to do it, which is five, commit, five instructions versus 12 instructions. So I'm, I'm pulling out what, and I'm making sure I'm not getting these very slow shift left, shift right commands, right? And, and those are slow not just on x86, they're also slow on neon, on ARM. So that was, uh, that was very challenging. Um, and so th I think we've, we, you know, we've really pounded this today, what goes in the WASM box, what doesn't go in the WASM box, and I think there's some debate on this kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, we, I think, hopefully you've been convinced if you were on the fence that there's an advantage to running things in WebAssembly today. Um, you know, so we want things to go in there. We just, if we want to be performant, we don't, not everything can kind of go there. So what, what I would kind of like would be cryptography in WebAssembly because, you know, OpenSSL should work on a very, um, variety of architectures and OSs. SIMD, maybe not. So I kind of, well, in my example, I actually kind of swap these. Um, like, I would prefer it was the other way. But in my example, SIMD's inside the WASM box and cryptography's outside. Although cryptography, the, the, um, the SIMD instructions were, ended up being four times faster. So it, it was, you know, it wasn't a complete waste of time. Um, okay, so demo time. All right, here we go. So, let's see. Okay, so, it's, nope. Yeah, okay, this is good. Sorry, this is always terrifying. Um, so here, we've got Adobe Firefly, and I was like, what's a good image? Because it doesn't understand WebAssembly, Firefly, you know, not in the model, WebAssembly for the Firefly AMI, AMI, AI uh, training data. But I was like, well, crabs and gophers and Amsterdam, right? So made some images. I picked one of them, uh, and then uh, I put it I put it somewhere. I put it in GitHub. I tried S3. It didn't work. I don't know why. Um, and uh, it was very slow. And so then, um, here. So I, here. So th th this is kind of the output of the, of the WASM cloud. And I'm just going to, so I'm not going to refresh that. Uh, but I will curl my way and see if we can get it. Uh, OK. So yeah, it worked. OK, and then uh, if we do CPA tool, so, so that's what it did. It, it grabbed the image, it transcoded it, and updated its C2PA manifest. Um, oh, sorry. I can't type up here when I'm, uh, sorry. It's true, you really can't type. CPA tool. Um, what is going on? Sorry. Oh. All right, uh, I'll see if I can, hold on. C oh, C2PA tool. <laughs> right. Tool. There we go. Wow. Um, transcode. So just seeing here, we've got the transcoding action that was done by the WASM cloud um, service. So, so that is the demo. And the whole idea is this is actually going to hopefully run uh, on edge compute and maybe in WASM cloud or if we can get that in, in multiple places. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the demo. Um, see if we can get back to PowerPoint. All right, handing it back over to Sean. Oh, sorry, actually, sorry, I have some notes. Um, we do use WebAssembly on the server side a lot at Adobe, but it runs in headless Chrome. In fact, in, including in the projects I'm working on around uh, newer web services around Creative Cloud. Um, so we have to at least match what we have in the browser for WebAssembly with WASI, um, or else it's going to be really hard to convince these people who already think they know WebAssembly to move over to WASI. So that's it. That's, that's it. And that's not a criticism. OK, thanks. OK. Well, I don't really have much, I don't really have much more to add. But uh, basically, I just want to summarize, you know, so like this whole journey we've been on. So we, we've gone to cloud native. We run Kubernetes. We run Kubernetes fairly well. We've got some business problems we want to try to solve. WebAssembly is a tool that helps us write better software faster. 
Uh, but you know, as we've seen, you know, both on the how we run it, although that experience is improving, how we write it, what the developer experience looks like, like this is hard. How do you convince, you know, thousands of Java developers that are used to writing code, you know, that is like VM based that we've wrapped a Docker container around that we've put up in the cloud, right? Like that's the model. How do we convince people essentially to get that back to a model where it's like we want to free you from those infrastructure concerns. We want you to be able to write the software once and run it anywhere. And so, um, you know, I think we're on that journey. I think we're in kind of like, you know, the technology adoption curve. We're in the like, you know, storming phase of this right now, trying to get all of this going. But this is worth it, right? It's worth it for the efficiency. It's worth it for the performance. It will be worth it for the developer experience. Wasm isn't the enabler of all these things, but we just also, you know, like, we're not going to stop running Kubernetes tomorrow. So. Uh, I envision a world where these coexist uh, far into the future, and I appreciate all the work that everyone in the community has been doing to make uh, all these things a reality. That's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Hello, absolutely fantastic. Um, definitely love to see it, and these are really challenging problems, so it's cool to see like how y'all actually tackling them. I know y'all have questions, so please, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand so I can come give you the mic. All the way in back. Oh, here we go. Making my way back here. Just give me a moment. Perfect. So yeah, I was like, oh, I got enough time to throw in. If you could please introduce yourself. So Larry Carvalho with Robust Cloud. Um, you know, we had the days of cloud first, then we went container first. If we are going to Wasm first, and you said, you know, developers, there's still some more time before it becomes easy for developers. What is stopping uh, the, the way to make Wasm easier for developers to use? Yeah, so, so right. So, so the point isn't that, I mean, um, the, if it's just we have to get the language supports, right? Um, we, we can't have every developer forking major, you know, Rust libraries, or, and let alone Rust, because Rust is the best, the best supported language, right? Um, so, you know, when you get down to Python or, or uh, you know, or other languages, that we, you know, we have to have a good story. We can't have them just say, yeah, you can use Python, but you can only, you know, go within the, the main uh, packages, right? So, yeah. I'd also throw out just like core, core library support, right? And, and sorting out dependencies and dependency trees and dependencies of dependencies. Uh, there's a talk, I can't remember which one it is, but like if anyone's ever seen a de dependency graph of like a real microservice, it's, it looks like a firecracker. It's an explosion, right? So like all it takes is one thing not working in Wasm to blow that whole thing up. Um, the provider model where you can, you know, basically like go out to native code, communicate and distribute systems fa fashion helps, don't get me wrong, but also like we need more things running in Wasm natively. Any other questions? All right, then give it up again. Thank you so much.